All righty, I think that's set up. Great. Um, okay, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to really thank um, Dr. David Kennedy uh, in, in joining us today for this uh, second in the series of neuro tools. And actually, uh, we chose some of these neuro tools very specifically to go first, second, third, and fourth because, um, uh, you know, first we wanted to set up uh, the RID project and how to, to get take advantage of, um, of uh, the neuroscience information framework tool catalogs. Um, and of course, uh, the second webinar. Uh, in the series is all about uh, the Nitric uh, tools and also a lot of the other tools um, that uh, Dr. Kennedy will will also discuss. Uh, uh, and and again, the really great part of having Dr. Kennedy talk today is that he is not only uh, the director of um, of the division of neuroinformatics, child and adolescent neuro development initiative. It's also called candy, and there are many more of these kinds of uh, multi-syllabic words, which um, which David Kennedy is um, absolutely uh, the head of. Um, uh, in addition to being uh, at Massachusetts General Hospital and um, and all of uh, these other things, but he's also um, the editor and the founding editor and chief of the journal Neuroinformatics. Uh, where he has been instrumental in really pushing reproducibility, uh, trying to figure out what reproducibility means in the context of neuroscience tools. And so again, I am, um, I am, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce David. And um, just a quick point of order, uh, everyone should be muted on their way into the webinar. And uh, if you would like to be unmuted, um, then uh, we'll do that at the end, but for the time being, we'll just do uh, the recording um, with everyone muted. So thank you very much. And David, please take this away. Great. Thank you, Anita. Thank you, uh, NIF, for uh, hosting this uh, nice series of presentations. And thank you all for uh, joining us here today in the Zoomosphere, Zoom whatever it's called out there, Radio Land. So, um, yeah, so I wanted to take a little bit of time now to talk a little bit about this resource called NITRIC, the Neuroimaging Informatics Tools and Resources Clearinghouse. Uh, but instead of just doing a boring demo uh, of the system, which is not necessarily boring, but uh, uh, can be quite interesting, but I wanted to give a little story and a little background first by way of a few slides before getting into a more official um, uh, demo. And so I'm going to use sort of the uh, idea of reproducible neuroimaging and the way re, you know resources such as Nitric, amongst many others, you know, can really be agents, you know, of you know helping to enable a sort of a more reproducible neuroimaging practices amongst the the greater community. So ultimately, you know, uh, uh, Nitric can be an agent of Repronym. Repronym happens to be the name of the reproducible neuroimaging center uh, that myself and a number of the NIF and other folks are are part of. So it's a shameless plug for that uh, resource as well. I think it's worthwhile to start by uh, taking some definitions of the concepts such as reproducibility. Uh, it's all the rage these days. NIH is, you know, busting people in all their grants about, you know, reproducibility and rigor and things of that sort. Uh, you know, journal articles are full of, you know, reproducibilities and the sky is falling and all sorts of other, you know, thoughts. Everyone defines reproducibility you know, a little bit differently. I'm not sure there's a right or wrong answer, but I might as well, in the context of neuroimaging analysis and sort of neuroimaging publications, say a little bit about you know, the context in which I'm going to try to use these terms. Uh, from the point of view of a publication, where we want to talk about the reproducibility of a publication, you know, we have the original article, which you know, takes some original data and an original analysis and generates that original result. Uh, the simplest, you know, kind of almost you know, trivial level one would want is to be able to re-execute, you know, anyone's, you know, publication with that exact same data and then exact same analysis, you know, can you get that exact same result? And even at this sort of trivial level, I challenge, you know, myself and, and many of us out there in listening land, you know, can you go back to a paper from a couple years ago and can you find that exact same data? Can you actually run that exact same analysis and can you verify that you get the exact same result? Well, I'm not convinced that I could do it, uh, and it may well be that you know, many of us out there you know, can't even you know, sort of achieve that you know, re-execution level of, of reproducibility. That said, you know, we want really to generalize a given result, you know, a result that we generate in a paper, you know, that's great, 
but you know we're happier with that result if us or someone else you know can get that same answer you know in in other you know types of situations so I sort of talk about sort of three different levels of generalization the first two you know uh, are you know just small changes on the original analysis if you take that exact same data but use a similar analysis you should get a similar you know type of result so if you're doing uh, subcortical volumes with free surfer, well, it'd be nice if you got the same sub answer, you know, with you know subcortical volumes from uh, FSL or something. Also, you know, you can use that exact same analysis you did, but use you know similar data. It would be really nice, you know, to get a you know, similar you know, result. So if I've got a bunch of kids who are, have an autism diagnosis and find something, uh, we should be able to take you know someone else's you know set of kids with autism uh, and run my exact same analysis and get that you know similar you know, result. But ultimately, sort of the holy grail, you know, the, you know, the types of, um, you know, things we really want, you know, are, you know, true findings, you know, of, you know, biology from the neuroimaging literature, you know, to really be generalizable is sort of the full, you know, reproducible generalizability where you use similar data, similar analysis, and get, you know, that, you know, similar result. We don't necessarily do a great job of, you know, declaring our exact methods in our publications. We don't always do a great job of sharing the exact data or exactly characterizing the data. Uh, and also even this concept of similar you know, has a lot of wiggle room in terms of its interpretation. You know, if I want to increase the impact of my finding, you know, I might say, oh, you know, my answer is different than someone else's because the spot of activation is you know, three you know, uh, millimeters to the left of someone else's. Or if you want to you know, call it to be you know, a replication, uh, you say, oh, this, uh, this answer is the same because ah, it's within three millimeters, but you know, the Tallarack coordinate you know, has that you know, uh, room uh, of interpretation. So again, even what's similar, you know, has lots of wiggle room and is often just wielded by the author to uh, enhance the, you know, feature they want to, uh, to uh, uh, describe. So ultimately, a lot of the issues that we work on in terms of the reproducibility of the neuroimaging literature is ways to really characterize well the actual data that's being used, really characterize well the actual analysis uh, that is going into a particular paper, so that when you write a paper, you know, you sort of put a flag, you know, in the ground and say, okay, this data, this analysis generates these results. And then that's, you know, a starting point that, you know, changing features of the analysis, changing features of the data, you know, should give, you know, the whole community, the whole, uh, an opportunity, you know, to explore the reproducibility and the stability you know, of a particular finding, a particular claim in uh, the context of this whole uh, um, uh, ecosystem of playing around with the, the nature of the analysis. I don't really want to talk about, you know, answers that are right or wrong. In general, you know, if you, you know, take some data and do an analysis and describe that completely, you know, that is the right answer with that analysis and that data. If it's a true generalizable feature, you know, of your disorder, of, of, of you know, your behavior that you're looking at, well, that's a evolving process. And that right now we kind of, you know, stunt some of that evolution. So can we do things in a way that really promotes, you know, that evolution and promotes more analysis around particular findings so that we can really establish, you know, how generalizable they really are. That sort of relates then to sort of the concept of, you know, where you know, one can imagine, you know, publications, you know, really evolving to. And a lot of this is happening already. Uh, but, you know, sort of the paper of the future, you know, will certainly include all the usual words and things that humans read, you know, as, as now. But one would argue that, you know, lots of other supplemental, uh, so to speak, information, you know, really ought to be included, you know, with all publications. You certainly want access. Uh, identification and you know, normally access somehow to the actual data that goes into a publication. You want uh, the precise sort of workflow specification. Uh, you want a specification of the actual execution environment uh, that you know, was used. And you really want the complete set of results. Because often we shortcut a lot of these things in the words that we use and that you can't really you know, define the entire workflow you know, in the words of a publication. You can't really describe the complete results you know, in the words of your publication. You'll pick some features and pick some story to tell about that, but there's no reason you know, to not have that complete set of results you know, as part of the publication you know, as well. So in the context of this, you know, I want to ask ourselves, you know, Given you know the data workflow and execution environment, you know can we really you know third party validate you know the exact results you know sort of independently in order to really gain this uh, re-executable uh, level of of publication? And once we have that re-executability, then the ability to play around with all those features and look at the result stability you know, becomes much much easier. So, uh, what is Nitric, and how can it act as enabler, assister, in support of the re-executable you know, publication? 
So I uh, should take a moment and you know, define you know, what Nitric is. Nitric is actually a set of three uh, uh, resources you know, together. Uh, Taken together, you know, they are, you know, really trying to support the you know, general neuroimaging community in terms of how you share resources, broadly defined software, data, etc., and how someone finds resources. Nitric has these three elements, the first of which is a resource registry, which is where someone can, uh, you know, annotate the uh, presence and existence of, you know, various software, various communities, various discussion groups, uh, you know, hardware, you know, all sorts of features, you know, can be a resource. Uh, so we have a registry you know, of all the resources. There's a Nitric Image Repository, which is a XNAT-based uh, database uh, of neuroimaging data. So it uh, makes data easy to search upon and sort and uh, make sub-collections of that data and supports data sharing in general and supports data aggregation across resources, uh, across sharing opportunities, uh, more, more feasible. And third, you know, sort of historically, uh, you might, you know, download, you know, software and download data to your own computing. Uh, but the Nitric has also created a computational environment, the Nitric computational, Nitric CE, which uh, helps uh, facilitate high performance, cloud-based and virtual computing, uh, in addition to sort of local computing on your, on your own hardware. And we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, sort of each of these three, you know, features of, of things, you know, as, as we go forward. So going back to the idea of a re-executable publication and how that would interact with you know, the functionalities that Nitric provides, well, for a given publication, Nitric, you know, in terms of the data that can be released within a Nitric project and data that can live within the Nitric image repository, is one of the you know, numerous uh, facilities that are available to freely you know, host uh, people's data, the data associated with you know, various publications. And we'll look at some examples of that in a bit. Nitric is also a fine place to host, you know, workflow specifications and identify the software that goes into them uh, and to uh, discover and, you know, gen uh, use, you know, sort of workflow management systems. Uh, many of our workflows today might be in some sort of shell script, you know, that you uh, run, but there's also workflow management managers, you know, such as NiPipe and Lani Pipeline and things like that, that uh, the more, you know, these pipeline and workflow management systems can be used, the easier it is to document, you know, the complete workflow uh, system. So uh, those types of things can be discovered, you know, on the Nitric uh, uh, resource uh, as well. In addition, you know, the execution environment, you know, is critical. Uh, there's, you know, numerous publications out there that say the exact same software, same version, et cetera, you know, may give you different answers if you execute in, you know, Mac OS or Linux this or, uh, you know, uh, Linux that. So the ability to control an execution environment is important. So the Nitric computational environment uh, via its you know, virtual machines and its uh, you know, cloud-based instances you know, are ways to you know, create specific uh, execution environments that uh, can be then monitored and, and saved and reused by, by others. And finally, while Nitric uh, resources itself do not necessarily host results. Uh, Nitric should be the go-to place to find, you know, the different results hosting, you know, opportunities. If you've done an fMRI, uh, you know, task and want to uh, share those results, well, hopefully you'll discover, you know, NeuroVault. And if you didn't know about it, well, Nitric would be able to tell you about, you know, the different uh, NeuroVault or the brain volume database or other, you know, resources, you know, that are out there already, you know, to host you know, the results of, of analysis. So sort of in each of these different levels, you know, bits and pieces of Nitric and the resources that Nitric points to, you know, can hopefully be, you know, integral parts you know, of, you know, supporting uh, the more routine generation of executable you know, publications. So with that background, uh, let's go off and look at a you know, live demo uh, of, the, of the system. Escape that. Go back here. Go full screen. So hopefully... Uh, you can all now see the front page you know, of Nitric. This is just what you get to when you go to nitric.org. Um, so just some features of the front page. Uh, there are you know, some featured tools and resources. There is some searching you know, that you can do. There are some links to some Nitric community functionalities you know, that's provided. There's some you know, listings of you know, things that are going on in terms of forums and updated files and you know, newly registered you know, projects, et cetera. Um, and there's a way on the left side there to sort of browse the content you know, of Nitric. 
So these are sort of useful also to remind us, you know, what the types of resources and features that are within you know, Nitric. Uh, you see, you know, here, you know, this domain level, a set of the different, you know, sort of high level domains of resource, you know, that Nitric supports. Of course, now Nitric was originally designed, you know, with the MRI community in mind. So there's lots and lots and lots of MRI specific, you know, resources are resources, you know, that are included, 699, you know, on that little screen there, but also computed tomography, clinical informatics, uh, EEG, you know, optical imaging, PET, etc. you know, are also these, you know, neuroimaging types of methodologies that, you know, are also relevant to Nitric. So each resource that comes in, you know, can characterize itself to which of these, you know, types of things, you know, that it's relevant to. Similarly, uh, lots of Nitrix content is software, uh, and each of the different software elements, you know, that uh, share with Nitrix, you know, are asked to declare some of their keywords and, and things of that sort. So uh, you can, you know, see the different types of, you know, resources uh, and software resources and the types of, you know, functionalities that they've declared. So if you're searching for a particular type of thing, you know, that's a way to whittle down and find the types of things that are, you know, hosted at Nitrix in terms of the software. Nitrix also host data, uh, and so there's, you know, numerous different, you know, types of data sets that are available, atlas data, test data sets, databases themselves, all of which, you know, can be identified, you know, here as well. Uh, and again, these are guides to the types of content and, you know, sort of quick links into, you know, searches, you know, on those particular, you know, types of features. And finally, diagnosis is a keyword of many of the resources that we, uh, we host. Now, diagnosis is a slightly interesting topic because when you create a piece of software, you know, FreeSurf or whatever, you're not necessarily, you know, declaring what uh, diagnoses it should be or could be, you know, applied to. Uh, on the other hand, you know, that tool, you know, FreeSurfer could be used in many, many, many publications and end up being used in many different uh, disorders. So while we let the tool developers declare diagnoses, we also let the, the tool developers list the different papers that have used that tool, and from the mesh terms, from the disease mesh terms, you know, we can add, you know, you know discover the types of uh, diagnoses that different tools and resources have been used for. So the nine that say they used epilepsy doesn't necessarily have to come from the authors declaring that, or the, from the uh, tool developers declaring that, but that emerges, you know, from the way the literature, you know, emerges, you know, from the use, you know, of that tool. So this is kind of the high level, you know, criterion by which, you know, one can browse and find data. I'm going to pick on, you know, one particular resource just to uh, sort of show what a resource listing looks like. In this case, I'm working from uh, Khan, the Functional Connectivity Toolbox. Uh, each Nitric page uh, is administered by someone from the community that, you know, developed, you know, that tool and resource. While Nitric provides the infrastructure, all of the descriptions of tools and resources come from the tool and resource team itself. Not Nitric telling you about Khan, but uh, Alfonso or you know, Susan telling you about you know, Khan. A given project homepage, you know, can have a cute little icon associated with it. You know, can have a you know brief description associated with it. Um, has a bunch of you know sort of standard you know tags and descriptions associated with it. Uh, Anita made sure that I wanted to point out that, you know, any of the unique identifiers that belong to a resource, you know, can be uh, displayed here. So this is an example of a resource that most, as most Nitric resources do, you know, have an RRID. Uh, so here you could get to the, you know, SciCrunch, you know, RRID homepage for this, or you could learn about RRIDs, depending on which link you um, uh, click on here. Uh, you can get some uh, activity features, you know, over here as well. Um, and then equally important, as I sort of mentioned before, is that uh, every tool and resource is, you know, encouraged, you know, to fill out, you know, a number of, you know, keywords and descriptors, you know, for it. So this particular, you know, resource, Khan, you know, does connectivity analysis, does, you know, diffusion modeling, or uh, I'm sorry, um, resting state, you know, temporal modeling, does principal component analysis, does regression testing and correlations and visualization and things like that. And these are critically important for when you do searching on these features, you know, that you can uh, you know, have these features available in order to search on. It declares what license this is being released under, some uh, development uh, statuses, some you know, languages and operating systems, et cetera, et cetera. Some tool associations about what it's known to work with or is designed to work with and things like that. And uh, activity. Khan happens to uh, use the forums fairly heavily. So as recently as eight minutes ago, someone posted uh, some question about pragmatic group theory you know, in the help forum.
anyway, so that's so that's sort of the high level descriptions. Uh, then you could jump to the downloads or jump to the forums or jump to the news, you know, functionalities that are sort of common to all Nitric projects. And projects can uh, provide sort of tool specific uh, links as well. So if the con tutorials want to link right off the um, off their homepage, well, then they can add that. And so these ones below that heavy line are the ones that the resource adds. These ones above the heavy line there are the sort of standard, you know, Nitric ones that you can expect, you know, to, to see on any given resource. Um, so that's kind of the basic structure of all resources. This is a software resource, but this could be a data resource. This could be a, uh, you know, a hardware you know, resource, or this could be a community of, you know, people who want to share stuff or discussions or things, you know, about any, you know, topic that they want. It's also important to note that while Nitric provides, you know, news and forum and download support capabilities and wikis and things like that locally, all of these functionalities, if you have your own infrastructure, you know, these functionalities can be remapped to your own infrastructure as well. So Nitric isn't telling you, you know, you have to use our infrastructure to do all these things. Uh, if you do that somewhere else, you know, we can link you know, to that. But if you don't have a wiki or don't have forums or, you know, don't have downloads that are up, you know, 24 seven you know, or firewalls or things like that that cause problems. Nitric provides, you know, sort of a level playing field for all that content so that, you know, no one can really claim that they don't have, you know, that kind of infrastructure available because the NIH, at least for the time being, uh, provides, you know, that resource, you know, to be there for you and all, you know, sort of tool developers, you know, can take advantage of that. So that's kind of the basic building blocks of a tool description. Uh, or a resource you know, description. Going back to our little, you know, re-executable uh, publication point of view and thinking about that top box on my little uh, diagram of boxes, you know, that was data. So if we imagine ourselves, you know, sitting at home writing, you know, with some new data, uh, writing our paper and saying, gee, I would like to make this data available, you know, so that uh, as part of, you know, the paper, one could, could link to that. So. Nitric is amongst the many different places that one could use, you know, to make that data available. In order to, so Nitric has a couple different ways, you know, to do that. Uh, and we will look at a particular project, the Thousand Functional Connectomes project. Uh, since I know that project name, you can search for any given project you know about in uh, the search bar at the homepage of Nitric. Nitric also works with uh, SciCrunch or the NIF folks, I forget exactly which, in order to get, you know, these nice little, um, file uh, name completion and you know, stuff. So thousand functional connectomes shows up nicely there. You can search on that. Here we get a list of all the different resources that you know either were called thousand functional connectomes or you know named thousand functional connectomes somewhere in their in their description. But for the purpose of this I want to go to the thousand functional connectomes project. So while I'm going to talk about this in the context of how thousand functional connectomes project happened to share some data the point of that, of this, going through this in the context of, hey, I want to share some data, is that, you know, anyone could create or sort of use this model, create it, their own little Nitric project, and, you know, use these same types of techniques in order to uh, make their data available, you know, to the community, you know, as well. So, back a long time ago, back in 19, I'm sorry, 2009, the Thousand Functional Connectomes folks, you know, created this project. They had data for, uh, you know, 20 some different sites for the original uh, uh, fun uh, Thousand Functional Connectomes publication um, that came from like 20 some different sites and it was, you know, a thousand and some, you know, different cases and they wanted to make that available, you know, to the world. Uh, so one of the first, you know, things they could use is, you know, while Nitric is sort of has um, software downloading in mind, there's no reason to download software, one could download uh, data files, you know, as well. So it's pretty low hanging fruit to create a Nitric project, uh, use the download functionality, uh, create little tar files, you know, of the data from your different sites in this case, uh, and make them available and as easy as, you know, clicking on them, you know, to get access, you know, to that data. Uh, so in this case, they're using the file release system of Nitric, created a package you know, called FCON you know, 1000, and in here there are, you know, the data sets from the different contributors, you know, sort of all grouped together as, you know, sets of, you know, tarballs. These tarballs are, you know, created to be, you know, roughly, you know, a couple gigabytes in size, and projects that are bigger than that got broken up into different uh, bits so that, you know, they're more easily you know, downloadable. So the entire thousand and some cases that were in the original 
thousand functional connectomes publication, you know, are all you know accessible, you know, here. That data was made available without any restrictions. So I'm not logged in or anything. I'm just a random you know, user who's come to this uh, website. I can click on any one of those files and it will start that you know, download for me. I'm gonna stop that because I don't actually need to download this, but uh, one you know, can get to that data. You know, there's no uh, you know, completely you know, public access you know, to these. There are other thousand functional connectomes projects where you do want to uh, have a little bit more control. So that's one of the nice things about the Nitric uh, file release system is you can re you the sharer you know, have complete control over the requirements you place on your users you know to access that data. These original F one thousand cases were um, you know completely in the open, so you can just click on that and download it. Other resources you may need to become a member you know, of the F1000 project, in which case you need a Nitric uh, account, and then you need to go ahead and join you know, that particular you know, team. Uh, you can join that team, uh, and if they you know, permit you, then you'll get access to you know, that particular data. And that's where the projects can put in whatever size you know, barrier you know, they want. This thousand functional connectomes project also holds the abide, the autism brain data exchange data, the ADHD two hundred you know data, and you know the core, the the, the reproduc uh, resting state you know, reproducibility you know project you know downloads. Each of those require that you at least you know register with the project. They don't require you to, I mean, other than agree to the data use agreements, they don't require you to sign anything or to you know tell what you're going to do with the data. You just have to physically apply and thus therefore have a sort of valid you know, email address. So that's the barrier they choose you know, to apply to uh, granting permission to people to join the project in order to get access to the you know, non-F1000 uh, things, more like the Abide and the ADHD 200 uh, resources. Other projects, uh, one could imagine Ping, the Pediatric Imaging Neurocognition Genetics uh, uh, resource. Uh, when you request to join there, you know, they have a slightly higher uh, requirement. They do want a, you know, paragraph about what you want to do with the data. They do want, you know, an email address from a sort of valid uh, research you know, institution and things like that. But again, it's up to the resource themselves about, you know, what barrier they want to place in order to let people have access, you know, to their data. So the barriers can be as high you know, as you want or as low as you want, you know, in terms of, of the natural resource. So I'm a investigator, I'm writing this paper, I wanna make the data available. Uh, I don't want it just to be made available to anyone, but no matter, I can make myself a little Nitric project. I can go to the little you know, download section and I can add you know, tarballs of my, um, of my data and I can require that you be, be a member and I can set my barrier to being a member at where I want that and therefore I can control access you know, to this and you know, have people you know, click through whatever official data use uh, agreement you want you know, as that is downloaded. So that's all well and good and that's a fairly low barrier to the sharer about getting uh, data available. That's not so good, I mean it's better than nothing for the sharee, the people you know, sharing the, uh, getting the data but you know it's great that the thousand functional connectomes project you know did their you know shared all this data. I really only want you know the males you know between you know twenty and twenty five who had three Tesla resting state data that had a um, uh, a TR of you know two seconds or something. If I ask that question now, uh, that means I have to sort of download <laughs> all that data and go through the readme files for each of the data sets and you know, figure out you know, where they're putting you know, TRs and field strengths and you know, ages and things like that. And, and, I, and you can do that. And it's better than before you know, sharing. But um, you know, that's not the ideal type of thing. So the other type of sharing that Nitric supports is their so, so David, I think you're getting to this, but um, uh, Jonathan Pollock just asked, how can you put the uh, different data sets together? And then a uh, second follow-up is, how can I do it in real time? And I think you're just about yep. to do so I'm just going to... Yes, I was going through the uh, garden path. You know, on the one thing, it's easy for the sharer, uh, but now your question is, you know, how can we make it easier for the sharee you know, to really find the subsets of data? And so that's where the Nitric Image Repository you know, comes in. So in order to do the type of thing you are, you're asking is you really need a proper database that uh, you know, 
has, you know, concepts of uh, who's male and who's female, who's, you know, left and right handed, you know, who's, you know, this age or that age, what's the uh, TR or, you know, TE, you know, of the different cases. So that's where the Nitric Image Repository comes in. So the, it's built on XNAT from uh, Dan Marcus's group at uh, WashU. Um, the, it's a little higher barrier to use, uh, and in fact, you know, when people use the Nitric image repository, we actually use Nitric curation. You know, so Nitric you know, manager will work with you to get your data put into the Nitric uh, image repository. And that's a little bit in contrast, say, to something like XNAT Central, where uh, people can just throw stuff you know, into that. But the point is, if you want to be able to, you know, query by gender or query by handedness or query by, you know, TRs and, and things like that, someone has to make sure that all the different projects that are integrated together, you know, code male and feel femaleness in the same way, code, you know, age in the same way, code uh, TRs and, you know, TEs and things, you know, in the same way. So in this case, you know, if you wanted to share your data in this more, you know, searchable database, you know, format, uh, you make your interests, you know, known to Nitric and Nitric then helps, works with you to, to make that available. So it's not quite so quick. You can't just dump it in there like you can with the image repository, with the, um, with the file release system, but uh, it's much more utilitarian to the community. So in this case, you know, for the 1,000 Functional Connectomes project, you know, there's these uh, 1,288 you know, subjects. Each individual subject you know, had doo -doo -doo -doo, you know, an MR session, so there's some you know, handedness and you know, age and uh, gender and things down there within the MR session of the data you know, that's being you know, made available. This one comes from Ann Arbor. Uh, the particular data that's available here is you know, two anatomic scans, one of which is anonymized, one of which is skull stripped, and a resting state you know, uh, functional you know, scan as well. I don't think those uh, thumbnails are working, but you get you know, the field strength and you know, the resolutions and the you know, TRs and, and features of that sort. So they have that kind of information for all, you know, 1,000 and some of their, you know, individual subjects. I'm going to go back right now to the Nitric IR homepage because I want to do the uh, show the sort of the power of, you know, aggregating a bunch of multiple project. We jumped into the func 1,000 functional connectomes data set because that's where we linked to from the Nitric uh, R. But there's also many other... And again, we're not logged in here, so these are all sort of publicly you know, open uh, data sets here. There's uh, the Thousand Functional Connectomes, there's you know, candy, scare, candy Share, Schizophrenia, Kids, there's Parkinson data, there's IXI, Study Forest, uh, and other you know, different uh, resources, all that are in you know, this particular you know, system. There's 14 different projects and you know, 8,000 or some imaging sessions at the moment. But, you know, so the type of thing, you know, that we're asking, if I wanted, you know, males and I just want, you know, 20 to 25, you know, or something, uh, and I wanted my field strength, let's just say that, to be three, whatever, you can, you know, do those kinds of queries, submit that query, wait a moment while it thinks, uh, and so across all the different data resources, if the demo gods are, you know, willing, We've discovered, you know, 286, you know, different cases, you know, that are resting state, you know, at three Tesla, uh, some of which from, come from the IXI uh, data set, some come from the FCON 1000, you know, data set, and if you scroll through there, you know, they can come from, you know, maybe you know, other, you know, resources as well, depending on what the query was and, you know, what kind of constraints you put on it. So, um that's the type of way that, you know, and in this case, you know, fine, I, you know, whittle down that uh, query to what I need, uh, then I have an option available here to just, you know, download, you know, that, you know, data set. In this download option, if I, again, the demo gods play nicely with me, you will get a window that then lets you choose, do you want you know, the T1s or the resting states, or uh, you know, do you really want all the cases, you know, which formats do you want, uh, which you know, uh, image types do you want, et cetera. So you can further whittle down what that result you know, will give back to you. And once you've created that, you can submit that request, and there's some JavaScript thing that will you know, do that download for you. So let me know if that didn't get to the details or nuance of that question, but that's where I was sort of going with that. So again, back to our little scenario, you know, I'm writing this paper, I want to share this data, I could make the tarball that data available through Nitric, 
uh, gee, I'd like it, you know, to really fit in with all these other things and be searchable and queryable and integrable with all these other resources. So I also then write an email to the Nitric administrators and say, hey, can you help me get this data into the image repository as well? Nitric, of course, loves to put more and more, you know, content in the image repository. Uh, or, and again, in general, you know, Nitric wants to support data getting into these database systems, be it Nitric, be it Loris, be it Lani IDA, be it Coins, et cetera. Because again, the power of being able to search across data releases, you know, is sort of critical to this integration uh, and critical to the efficiency of combining and pooling data. So those were a few uh, sort of topics on Nitric as a data sharing platform to support, you know, that uh, upper box, you know, of my little uh, box diagram. Uh, Nitric uh, also, as we've, you know, fairly clear is, you know, when you're talking about the workflow, you know, or the analysis, you know, workflow that you want to generate for your paper, it may well be that you already know you want to use FSL or whatever, so fine, you know, you go off and use FSL. Uh, but, you know, it may be that, you know, you don't necessarily know what software you want to use or, you know, yeah, I've used FSL, but I want to use something else, whatever. So Nitric, again, is helps you discover uh, tools and resources that are available to uh, do different things. So if you're looking for resources that do you know, image segmentation, you know, Nitric knows about 70 different you know, software resources that claim to do you know, segmentation. Well, 70 is an awful lot. Uh, we can whittle that down a little bit further. You know, gee, I'd really like these you know, to be some sort of you know, GPL you know, or open you know, style license. So that 70 now becomes uh, 22 you know, if you look for things with you know, an open-ish you know, type of license. Uh, gee, I'd really like it to work on my Mac since that's what I'm, you know, sitting here working on. Uh, so that whittles my 22 down to, you know, 11. And, uh, gee, you know, my data is already in Nifty. So here, let me, um, whittle that down to the resources that claim to do segmentation, that claim to do it with a, you know, open style, GPL style license on Macs and, you know, can use, you know, Nifty data. So that, you know, whittles me down to, you know, a smaller, more manageable, you know, set of, of resources to discover. Now, remember, all this content is managed by, you know, the content is managed by the tool resource developers, you know, themselves. So, um, you know, when you, uh, a, a tool that claims, you know, to do segmentation of some sort, you know, claims to do segmentation because the tool developer, you know, said that. So um, sometimes, you know, tool developers claim things that they don't actually do and because they misinter misinterpreted the keyword or for whatever reason. Uh, so anyway, so user beware that, you know, just because, you know, it shows up in this particular search doesn't necessarily mean that's the only ones because someone might not have selected the keywords or someone could have selected the keywords errantly. So anyway, user beware in that sense. Uh, but of those 11, you know, maybe I want to look at and, you know, sort of compare and contrast, Nitric gives you a little, you know, ability, you know, now to look, you know, across, you know, a bunch of these different, you know, resources. So I just happened to pick the first three there, BioImage Suite and Brain Suite and Carrot. Uh, and then so you can, you know, confirm, you know, well, you know the different uh, types of support, you know, different types of utilities, you know, some are more or less active on Nitric. Uh, some have more or less downloads from Nitric. So again, each of those metrics have a little bit of asterisk because not all downloads, you know, of, you know, bioimage suite or brain suite or, you know, carrot come from Nitric. So we don't necessarily know the total uh, downloads, but these are downloads that, you know, someone used Nitric, you know, to help get to. Uh, some have, you know, more or less, you know, recent, you know, activity and things like that. So again, we cannot tell you which resource to use, but we can try to help, uh, you know, give you some information about, you know, those particular you know, resources. So one can use that to discover, you know, different tools that might, you know, do a similar job. So again, in the discussion of generalizability where, yeah, I did my publication, you know, with software one, but, you know, there's 10 other softwares that nominally, you know, create a similar type of output. Hello? Um, so so uh, uh, Jonathan's asking another question. Do you have an example of an outcome of data integration? So going back to the data integration, and maybe if this is going to be too far off from your uh, your current uh, mode here, maybe we can take this at the end, but I um, just wanted to throw it out there just to see. Yeah, I'm not going to have a very good example off the top of my head, so I will like to defer that, although I think if I think about it a little bit more, there are some certainly that I know of that are sort of in progress uh, to mix across those data, mix across those data sets, but... Uh, that's still a sort of in progress type of thing. So happy to talk about that, but uh, I'm not sure. 
<laughs> I don't have a great example off the top of my head that I can show that, oh yes, this you know pooled across these you know three sites and and here's the, here's you know the advantage of doing that. Uh, so just to um, so fine, so one can discover you know software they didn't know about. Uh, and in terms of the other element of that sort of execution of the workflow side of things is, you know, in addition to, you know, shell scripts and things like that, which are fine. And as long as you keep and version your shell scripts and, and things like that, you know, your shell script can be as, you know, document as concrete a documentation of, of the software you're using. Um, you know, it's more and more, you know, common to use, you know, various pipelining systems, you know, Lani pipeline or NiPipe or things like that to help manage, you know, complex workflows. Uh, so those can also be, you know, discovered in, you know, Nitric by, you know, looking for softwares, you know, about, you know, workflows and, and things like that. So that's kind of that, you know, middle line of my box diagram, the workflows and, uh, and the so software workflow. Uh, the other element of that is the computational environment. Uh, because, you know, while it's well and fine to use, you know, FreeSurfer and, you know, AFNI and, you know, do some analysis, uh, we know it matters if you do it on your, you know, desktop uh, Macintosh or your, uh, you know, local high-performance, you know, Linux systems and things like that. You know, operating system matters. So one of the options in trying to put a little bit more control in the user's hand about, you know, what operating systems and what, you know, versions and, you know, all the other subtle details of, you know, executing particular workflows is the Nitric computational environment. Nitric computational environment is built off of NeuroDebian uh, and is, you know, sort of a pre-configured computer, so to speak, virtual computer in this case, that has a bunch of, you know, your favorite, you know, um, uh, neuroimaging packages pre-installed you know, on it. So instead of having to install FSL and ANTS and Nifty and, 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 and uh, AFNI and things like that, you know, all of these are pre-installed onto a virtual computer. And that virtual computer you know, can easily play in a number of different you know, types of, of environments. Uh, that can certainly be run on your own infrastructure through uh, virtual machine players like VMware and uh, things of that sort. Uh, there's a number of commercial cloud providers, you know, that one can run these on. I've done a lot of work with the Amazon, you know, marketplace. Uh, there is also, you know, uh, VM uh, Azure, you know, with Microsoft. Uh, and there can also be Docker and other, you know, ways to run, you know, these, uh, you know, Nitric computational environment operating systems in, in other, other fashions. Uh, so again, there's not enough time in this context to go through a complete demo of the Nitric computational environment on, on AWS, but I will take you through a little bit of the highlights and then either ask me separately or we can do a separate demo. And there's some YouTube videos on, on doing all this that are available you know, as well. But, you know, so the, one of the ways of launching the Nitric computational environment through the Amazon uh, web services through their market, Amazon marketplace that link happens to be here. If you go to the Amazon you know, marketplace, uh, there are the Nitric, plain old Nitric computational environment. There's also sort of a specialized human connectome project computational environment, uh, whereas the normal uh, Nitric environment, you know, uses the most recent versions of FreeSurfer and, you know, FSL and things like that. The specific pipelines of the human connectome project are you know, run slightly set, set different versions of some of those tools. So this one was put together to be specific to the pipelines of, you know, that particular environment. So you launch, you know, one of these things using your usual AWS launching tools that we're not going to worry about too much. I've pre-done that and have a little, you know, Amazon machine, you know, running for us. When those launch, you get a console page uh, where you can create users, you know, on this resource. You can create uh, connections to that. Once this uh, instance starts, you have full SSH access to it, so you can work at it from your own command line, or you have a virtual desktop that you can access. And so we can connect to that virtual desktop through a utility called you know, Guacamole, which uh, lets us then you know, access you know, this particular virtual computer you know, that's sitting out there you know, in the Amazon uh, sphere. Now, one has to pay you know, for Amazon. So the, the Amazon part of this is not free, but there is no additional upcharge or additional sort of Nitric side charge you know, to this. You know, so Nitric has done all the labor of pre-configuring the machine with AFNI and FSL and uh, various you know, things on it so that you can you know, fairly easily you know, launch yourself into an instance where you have you know, all these tools sort of you know, pre-installed and, and there. You can then you know, copy data to this instance to um, you know, do whatever analysis you want to do. You can mount uh, different 
uh, Amazon, you know, mount points like OpenFMRI and you know, others that you have access to, uh, and you can manage, you know, the different uh, software that's on there yourself. Now, this is just one particular small machine that's running here, but Again, when you launch the machine, or after you launch the machine, you can select the power of that machine. So this is a simple, you know, two-core, uh, low-powered machine. But if you need to run, you know, a thousand free surfers, uh, you may want, you know, 32 or 64 cores and running, you know, a bunch of different free surfers, you know, simultaneously. Uh, you can use, you know, larger instances, more memory. Uh, there are GPU-enabled instances, and you can also go further to create. Uh, clusters of computers using the star cluster uh, functionality that we also support. Uh, so that's really sort of a high-level discussion of the initial computational environment. Again, everything I've talked about, there's you know much more that I can say about it. But these are the types of functionalities that um, you know one hopes you know that can be you know useful utilities as you know everyone tries to ponder you know how to increase the reliability, how to increase the re-executability you know, of their publications in the future and uh, to work towards you know re-executability and you know use that as a launching point into more uh, rigor in terms of our generalizability and reproducibility of our various publications. So I think with that I will um, stop and uh, entertain questions and other things. Okay, so um, you know we had the uh, questions from uh, from Dr. Pollock in the uh, during the session, and if you want to say anything more about that, um, we, can, we can maybe start with that. But I also have some some questions that were uh, you know that were at the tip of my uh, my tongue as as you were talking. So um, you know I'll let people go ahead and unmute themselves or uh, put their questions into the chat. Um, either way would be great. So. Um, do you have anything more to say about maybe outcomes of the uh, integrated data? Um, and actually, Dr. Pollock just asked another one, which is how does Nitric deal with variability from machine to machine in general MRI data? So for that latter question, again, Nitric itself does not necessarily deal with the machine to machine variability. Nitric is, you know, the computational environment you know, is one type of situation where we can, you know, make sure people are using a common, in this case, you know, NeuroDebian 1404, uh, you know, release uh, with, you know, controlled, you know, versions of, you know, FreeSurfer, FSL, et cetera, that, you know, persists, you know, forever. So anyone, you know, can get back to that exact same uh, environment. If you change that environment, the nice thing about the cloud situ situations is you can then lock in a new AMI, uh, Amazon Machine Instance, you know, for that. And, you know, if you, uh, do that and lock those away, you know, you, those can retain the same environment that was used for whatever your, your publication was. So it's one way to sort of manage, you know, instead of the wild type variability of, you know, everyone's random machines and their, their things, you know, to lock into particular machines, you know, is one of the solutions that Nitric helps provide. That said, you know, even more recently, all these Docker and uh, singularity, you know, types of instances of particular tools is the other way that tool developers can really give to a community uh, machine uh, operating software that uh, is more consistent in terms of you know what operating system they're they're on. So, in terms of managing uh, machines, you know, Nitric's job is one to make sure that people are aware that uh, operating system matters, uh, and two to help point them to the Docker's and virtual machines and other solutions for each tool you know that can be used to help reduce the variance that you know is seen in in the native sort of wild type runs of, of these things. So that's as much an educational thing to the developers and to the users to try to use a common uh, set of operating systems. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's roughly what, what he meant. Um, but I think there was something that you didn't quite address, which is the machine actually generating the fMRIs. So um, oh. you, can you address the scanners and the variability in the various scanners that, um, that you know, is quite prevalent in this type of data? Yeah, so from the Nitric point of view, yeah, again, I'm going to take a weak you know, answer in terms of you know, Nitric's job is to help get that data out there so that the scientists can understand better to what extent it matters if you're on GE or Philips or TR of 750 or TR of 1000 or um, you know, a spiral in or spiral out or Lip DPI or, or features like that. It is certainly the case that you know people in general, you know, using lots of different uh, data sets, 
you know, very consistently and most data sets, you know, structural resting state, et cetera, do find significant uh, device effects, you know, that, that are definitely present. Uh, so the presence of de device effects that is becoming fairly well known means that when you pool data from these different sites, you have to be careful to control for and, you know, correct for, you know, sort of the site effects that are, you know, getting, you know, inserted into the data. And so that's, I would sort of say, is still an open question that when faced with a, a thousand of your own cases and, you know, a hundred cases that you might get from uh, FCON 1000, you know, all of my cases are on one machine and these hundred cases I'm going to add are from another machine, you know, there is a valid question. Is that, is that 1100 cases, you know, better or worse than my, you know, sort of more pure 1,000 cases, you know, because of the extra noise. I'm going to add some noise because it's different, you know, machine details. Uh, am I gaining that noise back by the N, you know, difference and things like that? So I don't, that's a question that I'm personally very interested in and working on sort of in our reprenim and, and uh, candy share efforts. But um, I think that's still an empirical question that, you know, Nitric helps people to answer that, but it's still a, in the hands of, of the scientists to figure out exactly how to mix and match, you know, these data sets appropriately and where the benefit is. Um, okay, so I have a question um, that, you know, was, was kind of irking me or not irking me, but, you know, getting me a little bit excited because, um, you know, Nitric does have these, these um, this kind of complete, relatively complete both set of tools the uh, repository and the environment, which are all kind of working together, which is great. So how close, but at the same time, you know, I, I have also uh, heard from um, one of the editors of PLOS that, um, you know, publishers don't like to carry big sticks uh, because, you know, they don't want to be seen as the, uh, the part of the research enterprise where, you know, which is just hitting researchers with sticks. So the question though, for, for me is, how close, you know, from your, your neuroimaging uh, journal hat, how close do you think we actually are to having, and I, I know you've done a lot of work on this, um, to having a reproducible, re-executable paper or set of papers? Can we, you know, is there any way that we could put a timeline on it? Can we put a set of... Um, uh, uh, pipelines in place that say, okay, if you do this, 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 and this, and you submit to neuroinformatics, this will be, you know, one way that we can actually create that re-executable paper. And um, yes, exactly. That is <laughs> exactly what I was thinking of. Uh, <laughs> so I was trying not to be overly self-serving, but there happens to be. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, how so. close are we? To, how close are we to doing it? One of the frustrating things to me a little bit, and I say frustrating in quotes, is it's doable, you know, today. You know, one can, you know, wrap up the data and put it somewhere. It could be in Nitric, it could be in Zenodo, it can go somewhere. You can use an iPipe, you know, pipeline, or you can use a shell script. You can make that available. You can, you know, tar up, you know, your results, and you can write a little, you know, Python script that, you know, compares someone else's results to your results on the nominally same data and validate or invalidate that, you know, operating system matters and things like that. That's doable, but, you know, that takes, you know, three times as long, you know, as, you know, the original paper, which just says, hey, you know, I found this, you know, difference. If you want to take three times longer and do all these other things, uh, you know, that could be done today. So that's, again, one of the missions of things like, you know, ReaperNim is that last mile, you know, the NIFs and Nitrix and, you know, software sharing and data hosts, you know, lots of data hosts exist, lots of, you know, result hosts exist, lots of software tracking things exist, but it's still, most papers published today, you know, don't come anywhere near, you know, including, you know, this kind of content uh, in terms of, you know, exact, you know, sort of re-executability executability of a paper. So it still takes too long, and a journal who wants to mandate you know, that you do this is going to cut off most of their submitters at the moment because you're now saying a paper that you could write in a month you know, could take, let's say, three months you know, to write, and people will be very upset with that. So it's, in this case, all about the tools of making it simpler. You know, how simple can it be that once you've done this analysis to have that you know, result you know, wrapped up nicely that's you know, sort of one click away from your free surfer, one click away from your SPM to wrap those results and put them you know, somewhere. Uh, your 
environment that's running, you know, SPM should be able to write out, you know, the, you know, workflow you use and, you know, sort of make that easy, you know, to capture. So the ultimate goal is it's got to be easier or else young people won't do it. So how can we give, you know, the average, you know, neuroimaging analyst the tools to, you know, sort of monitor their environment, wrap that environment, wrap that data set, wrap that uh, result uh, so that it's simple to add as, you know, supplementary data to your publications, you know, these details. So that's a challenge and we're still, you know, a few days, no, a few <laughs> years away from uh, really making that simple enough for the end users and we're trying to, you know, plot along there. And from my journal hat, I can certainly say that, you know, neuroinformatics has evolved, you know, from no information sharing policy to at least a declaration of where your data and software are coming from, which you know, could be, you know, available on request or, or not available, to a new mandate that the data you're using has to be available somewhere. You know, again, it doesn't have to be publicly available, but someone has to be able to get at it. And your software has to be available somewhere. And again, that's one of the hiding, play, not hiding, not because people are not being, you know, uh, uh, in, well, people are not being intentionally, you know, uh, hiding, you know, stuff. But again, an awful lot of, you know, things get hacked together and, you know, software that lives at home and, you know, getting people to at least, you know, for better or for worse, you know, make whatever software you use available so that, you know, at least that's not a black box, a hidden bit to the paper that can never really be, be observed. So neuroinformatics is definitely now requiring that software be available, that the data be available, not just, you know, the passive statement, but the active statements. Now it's all well and fine for Netric, I mean, for uh, neuroinformatics to do that. It's mostly a technical journal and most of the things that get reported are sort of technical proofs of concepts so it's, you know, all well and fine for us to do that. But until the neuroimages and the neurons and, you know, other, you know, real science uh, uh, journals were to follow along. And I just don't think we're quite there in terms of, I mean, there would be too much revolting in that case, you know, if neuroimage you know, tried to do that. Because the tools aren't there yet. And so we all have to work on our tools to make that so simple. Uh, I, I fully agree. And um, the only other, like, tiny follow-up uh, from my perspective is, do you think it's working? <laughs> uh, I mean, do you have a sense yet of whether or not well, they're producing better amounts of data that are actually shared, tools that are shared, and, and have you looked at it yet? Or is that kind of on the horizon once you I get- I think that's still mostly on the horizon, but we know, well, what I will say is, and again, I know, we know we're doing a bad job with the status quo. Uh, again, we've heard from, you know, the Tom Insels and Norval Volkows of the world, you know, et cetera, for how irreproducible, you know, we've, you know, the billions of dollars in neuroimaging and genetics and things are, you know, where are we in terms of, you know, a kid with, you know, uh, addiction issues or an adult with, you know, depression or a, you know, another kid with autism, you know, we're technically, you know, clinically in the same place where we were, you know, before all this investment. So the current status quo is not you know, working all that well. I cannot yet point to known things that are better now that you know data is more likely shared or more as the processes are more likely uh uh reproducible i know the scientists have been very successful in writing billions of papers you know and there's no lack of papers that say oh autism you know, affects this or oh you know, marijuana use you know affects that well yeah none of these you know there's a lot of papers that say that, that doesn't happen too so we, we're just you know Succeeding at writing papers, we're succeeding at writing grants, but we're not actually succeeding at uh, building, you know, castling up, you know, the knowledge in terms of places where things that do replicate and things that don't replicate and understanding, you know, that. And so while I can't point to successes yet, I can point to the failures and to the likelihood of this being, again, it's still a wish, but the, these types of things are the way to try to get a handle back on some of these variances that we just lose in our current publication system. Mm -hmm. And I think that, again, you're, you're doing all of the things that you can probably do except for potentially carrying a larger stick. And I'm not sure, um, you know, that anyone can, can really carry a, a large enough stick. Well, maybe, right. maybe Jonathan can, but... Uh. Yeah. And, and the NIH, to their you know, credit, is, you know, they haven't jumped all the way, you know, to you know, mandating all of this. But again, they have to, um, you know up the uh, bar and again, the rigor and producibility, you know, are things like that. Supporting, you know, the NIFs and Nitrix and some of the resources of the world, you know, are part of that. And um, 
you know, things like NDAR or NDA and things like that. These are all pieces, you know, of that puzzle that it's great. The NIH and other, you know, funding agencies are, are part of that. You know, there's still a long ways to go, but, but these are elements and it's, you know, slow. Okay, so I think that is uh, going to wrap up the time that we have for today. And I'd like to thank um, you, David. And of course, I'd love to thank all of our uh, uh, listeners out in, uh, in Zoom land. And uh, next week, we'll get to hear about um, uh, a different kind of computational ex environment, in, in fact, a gateway. So we will look forward to that. And thank you very much, everybody. Thank you all and um, for uh, listening. And thanks, Jonathan, for the questions. <laughs>